and beautiful. Thank you. This is the uh, Open Global Mind call on Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. I almost said 2022. I don't know why. You'd think I'd be getting used to it. Um, greetings. Good morning. How is everybody? Doing okay? Judy, uh, Portland looks like Minneapolis today. Uh, well, we were supposed to get a lot of snow, but so far we've only got about four or five inches, so it's not bad. It went north of us, so we just got a minimal amount and not getting any today, which was when it was supposed to happen, so I'm grateful. But the, the piles of snow outside are pretty high, because at one point the the bank across the street from me where they plow all the snow was six feet tall. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, this has been a heavy snowfall winter for us. Apparently East Coast resorts are suffering like crazy because it's been too mild, too warm on the East Coast and there's just no snow. <laughs> well, I guess it's stopping it here. <laughs> yeah. so we had frost here last night. <laughs> That's it's currently 34 degrees outside. Nice. Unusual that, for our that, neck of the woods. Yeah. That, that's unusual but, for you. It's now not you unheard said, of, but it is unusual, especially this late in the season, you know. I would explain well, why you, you're not in your yard. Yeah, that you, is why I'm not in my yard, actually. Yeah, it, it's like 18 here, which is pretty mild, actually, for February. <laughs> uh, frequently, we've had almost no super, super cold days here this winter. Usually we get some days when the wind chill is 35 below or something because the actual temperature is 10 below or we just haven't been having that weather this year. Did you say you had snow in, in Oregon this morning, Jerry? Yeah, yeah, Portland. It snowed, started snowing at noon yesterday and just kept going. And lo lots of big fluffy flakes too. So it was pretty. Um, so we don't have a topic for today and today is a topic day. And uh, the floor is open for topic recommendations. There's a few things on my mind, but I'd love to hear what's on your mind. And it could be any, we could wander over to art. We could uh, go any direction. We don't need to stay on global crises or, uh, <laughs> or other sorts of things. Stacey. How about if we all put one word in the chat and see what comes up? That sounds good. The proposal is to put one word in the chat. Uh, everybody ponder for a moment what one word would work for you and uh, please do that. Just the first word that comes comes like through your brain pan. Substack. Well, there you go. So the words so far are joy, doubt, water, substack, synthesis, people, gratitude, generative. And Gil, your phantom, your fathom note taker doesn't seem to want to participate. So, so it goes. Ambition. The prompt was uh, what one word? is top of mind because we're looking for a topic yes it's like a stimulation and does anyone want to synthesize anything from the list of words that showed up for us or does any of the words that showed up have particular energy for a couple other people rick has his hand up Oh, uh, cool. I wasn't sorry. You were in the, in the corner of my display. Go ahead, Rick. That's so fine. No, I, the reason why I put Substack on is because I just came from a, ch a clubhouse chat with somebody where we were talking about Substack. And I, I just launched my first um, <clears throat> newsletter on it. And I just see, so, you know, uh, I just see so much potential about how you could potentially interact between it. So the guy I just spoke with, was a uh, regenerative architect and his perspective was just i just blown away by it. but he's so unassuming when i said have you told your story you've written it out and he says no i haven't i said so i said well why do you write take this little conversation and turn it into a story 
but then use the story as a way of having an audio or a Zoom thing where people have read the story and then they can come and interview and then have it sort of like a, an iterative uh, tapestries of different threads of stories that are connected rather than disconnected because our story making um, and the hero's journey are broken. So we need we need to co-create something very different to what we're living with at the moment. So that's that's where I'm just coming off from. Okay. Rick, thank you. Um, and I've been reading the heroine with a thousand and one faces, which uh, is a critique of this the hero's journey and traditional storytelling and opens up all kinds of interesting new vistas for for that. Um, so that re resonates for me. Uh, can, Judy, you put, could, can you put that reference in the thing? I, 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 oh, I, sure. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Judy, then Mark. I was just thinking about people in the context of engagement of people, because it seems as though people are pretty diffuse right now, and how we might engage people in thinking and action would be of interest to me. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Mark, Mark C. Just pausing a tiny bit. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Rick. Um, one of the interesting projects that uh, a wizard of interactive um, development is working with uh, the Internet Archive to do is the Tapestries Project. And the interactive Tapestries Project, um, basically turning a web browser into more than just a document but links from web pages to web pages visually kind of a uh, visual um, graph. and my take on it is trying to create a web standard for kind of navigable um, visual links um, between things. So the word tapestry is a beautiful one. Thank you for bringing it into the conversation, Rick. Um, that sounds very uh, OGM-y and very fun. Do, can you say anything more about it? The, I'm Googling interactive tapestry internet archive and getting nothing. So uh, it's a project that I don't know how much I can say other than the name. So I will check. Would you have to kill us all afterward? No, of course Good. not. Good. That's so no. convenient when that happens. I'd have to kiss you all, and that would be oh. too mergy. <laughs> Never heard that, that one before. Be, that would just be too <coughs> too rough for me this morning. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll check on that. Um, thank you. That'd be great. And uh, um, uh, Pete. Um, I, Mark, if you, you may you may be interested in uh, fellowship of the link, uh, and there's a uh, it's part of OGM, and uh, there's a Mattermost channel for it. Uh, we also meet on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific. And and Wednesday is I'm on the UX team, the user experience team at uh, yeah. the Internet Archive, and 11 o'clock is our stand up meeting. So. Uh -huh. Oops. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Part a good Thank chunk you. of uh, a good chunk of fellowship of the link is also in Europe. So I, later is bad, and and early is probably too early for it. earlier is probably too early. But anyway, think... you might you might join the the channel and check it out. I will. Thank you so much, Pete. Um. We could also share poems we love. Uh, we could do a bunch of things. Uh, good to see you, Shimon, and Doug, glad you're on the call. Um, and what the one question that was on my mind is the one sort of that Pete raised on the Google group uh, yesterday, I guess, or maybe was it the day before already, um, about platform choices and how these how our conversations go and all of that. And I'm I'm happy to go there, but that feels that feels strangely a little too close to where we are, too close to home. And I wouldn't mind 
us exploring um, outer spaces a little bit today. It would be great. I think if I'm hearing you correctly, Jerry, uh, is that you'd like to elevate it to a higher sort of humanitarian level than rather than getting in the weeds of the technology. Is that, I don't know whether I heard you correctly or not, or maybe you could clarify what you meant. Uh, that was not my intention, but it's a nice uh, riff on it. Uh, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not trying to elevate uh, us. I'm trying to maybe liberate and explore a little bit uh and let us let us sort of wander someplace where our senses are maybe also where our feelings are uh where our bodies are any any of those kinds of things would be uh really really interesting uh mr kronza morning again um what's been on my mind a lot is um one of my mottos in training and that motto is, quote, be more human. So I have a conjecture that we really don't understand the biology of the human brain. And the human brain is more complex than all the computers on the planet combined. More than Apple, more than Google, more than anything. It's not comparable easily because it's incredibly different from a computer. And I take it, Doug, Breitbart, Gil, Shimon, that your brain is so much more powerful and interesting, complex, weird, dangerous than all the computers and all the software in the world put together so far. And I don't feel there's an appreciation of what we carry on our shoulders. Um, I've been paying attention to the frenzy uh, about AI, and it seems that a fun thing to do would be to kind of like have a Oh, who is the guy who raced the railroad and tried to, you know, put in the spikes while... Uh, not Paul Bunyan. Uh, uh, Casey, no, Casey Jones. Jones. No, Casey Jones was an engineer. The guy who... Um, it was a race between a man and a, and a machine. Yeah. Um, and I forget. John I, I, Henry. John, John Henry. Henry. John Henry? Yes, sir. Anyway. Sounds right. Yeah. John Henry, man or horse? John person? Henry was a steam driving man. Exactly so. Sing the song, Ken. Uh, I'm going to spare you that. Okay. Hmm. And we have a lot of problems. And who can solve the problem first? The AI or a person? The AI or a team? Um, two AIs talking to each other. Um, Chat BT. GPT talking to um, Tesla's AI um, and having a conversation back and forth to solve a problem um, with a human interface kind of saying, okay, I'm going to re represent chat GPT and I'm going to ask this other AI, Tesla's AI, a question and then, okay, it's going to answer and I'm going to like make it really cool and ask and respond to chat GPT and kind of, you know, play all these games with the umbrella term intelligence. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to uh, go quiet with that for a second and then pass the mic to Shimon. So uh, Shimon, why don't you take as long as you wish to step into the conversation? Yeah, I, I like the idea of brains and AI. I actually been spending a lot of time on that, really trying to understand the comparison between brain function and how, you know, the AI bots have been developed and in terms of just computational neuroscience. It actually brings me back as a resident in psychiatry about 40 years ago. 
I was involved with a project with neuronal networks trying to really think about, and it was very early on, how the structure of the brain actually can inform developing computers. But uh, I really like the ideas presented in terms of combining the brain, our brain, with all the values and emotions and things like that with the power of artificial intelligence, just the way it's structured. And I think we're going to get to a point where somehow understanding our own physiological brain structure and aligning it with computers, which is still far away, we can solve a lot of problems. The problem that I'm working on right now, which is sort of like crazy uh, for me, is trying to use or being informed with AI to build a constitution for the state of Israel. So the state of Israel, as many of you know right now, is going through a huge, huge problem. Much of it is a consequence and symptom of something, the original sin or whatever it was in 1948, that they did not develop a constitution. And the same issues that prevented them from doing it then are the things that essentially are driving the horrible you know, situation in Israel right now. So in many circles, people have talked about developing a constitution. And what I decided to, since I'm very interested in testing the chatbot GPT-3, I decided to use that as a framework to develop the structure for a constitutional uh, process that then involved people to crowdsource and essentially sortition and deliberative democracy and all those concepts come into play. So I've come along, you know, I'm pretty far along with the process. And I do like the idea of Substack because Substack has become an invaluable publishing platform. And it really, really allows uh, for collaboration. So I'm really excited. I'm hoping that perhaps we can talk about that as well. How do we combine Substack together with AI, together with crowdsourcing? I've used Kumu a lot in the process just to visualize. I haven't used, uh, Jerry, I haven't used your brain that much, but who knows, maybe at some point. So it's nice to be back. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Um, I really did not know that Israel had no constitution. It has basic laws. Um, and well, that's, that... well, that's one of the problems because basic laws can be essentially created with 61, with half plus one of the legislatures. So it can then be overruled. I think mean, it's pretty complex, but I do think that so far, working with chat GPT has been incredible in terms of recognizing processes, telling me about people involved, let's say in the Constitutional Convention in 47, linking me with different you know, efforts to do it. So it's been really, really great. Uh, apparently, the German constitution is among the best constitutions on the planet. Uh, and also, Iceland went through a process of trying to rewrite its constitution after the 2008-2009 the global financial crisis, got pretty far, and then failed to ratify it. Yeah, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm building on, again, I don't know how much people want to get into Israeli politics, but, you know, the leader of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu, actually grew up where I live essentially. So, and he keeps talking about being a Democrat, a Madisonian Democrat. So what I'm actually doing is comparing the American process of developing the constitution, including the Federalist Papers, to what Israel needs to go through. So again, I find that chat GPT is very, very helpful, again, in creating, you know, structure. And I'm hoping to put my Israeli Federalist Papers on Substack. Shimon, thank you. That's uh, really interesting. Uh, Gil and Stewart, and please take your time stepping in.
I wanted to say something about humanness and AI, but first I, I need to respond to Shimon because it's very rich provocation that you've offered. Um, and just a couple of thoughts there on, on the constitutional process, Chile has just gone through rewriting a constitution and also didn't ratify. So add that to the to the brain stack there, Jerry. Um, it, it, it strikes me that the contrast between constitution and the basic law is that constitution acts as kind of a shock absorber. It's a damper uh, that only allows certain change that 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 that, that, that moderates the degree and the pace of change in an organizational system. Um, and like you know, with 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 fifty percent plus one, you can swing all over the place. With the constitution, you have a ratification process that slows that down. Um, the, the challenge that strikes me with Israel versus the Federalists is that um, uh, it, it takes common purpose to build a constitution. And with all the differences that the, uh, that the, that the founders had, there was some degree of common purpose that they could organize around and uh, in Israel today, or in the United States today, if we were to have a constitutional convention here, I'm not sure if there's enough common purpose to keep that game on track. So fascinating. I would love to talk with you more about it, Shimon, uh, at another time. Um, on, on the matter of, uh, of AI and humanness and mind, um, um, uh, um, one of my concerns in this unfolding process is that, uh, and Mark, you you you, know, you sort of resonated this for me, is that we think of we 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 think a lot of the brain and creating an artificial brain, and but brain is only a part of what it is to be human, and brain is only a part of mind, uh, and we have the enteric nervous system, the hormonal systems, and you know and so many aspects of where mind is situated. Um, you know, some would argue that this is not a collection of 20 minds in a conversation together, but it's a mind with an emerging conversation. Uh, with interactions that are deep, uh, we're affecting each other biochemically as we speak and listen. Uh, so the locus of mind is hard to pinpoint. And so AI in its maybe worst case is an extreme example of the mechanistic theory of life that you know it's all it's all reducible to stuff and if you build the right structure of stuff you can duplicate the function of what's happening here and i think that's my operating assumption right now is that's a very deep estimological fallacy uh, uh, and takes us down some really dangerous rat holes um, so i'm interested in you know when we talk about what it is to be human or how we build machines that enhance human, it seems important to be really cognizant, there's that word, of that, whatever that means, to take, you know, to take that broader perspective of humanness and thought and mind into account. Um, for those who haven't seen it, Gregory Bateson did a book late in his life called Mind and Nature, um, which to you know, ridiculously oversimplifies, it says that mind is a, is, is, is a function of the living world, not of the individual organisms in it only. There are obviously unique individual aspects of it. Uh, but that perspective provides a really different orientation to what we think about and what we do and how we proceed in the world. Um, and um, the, you know, the, 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 question that I've been chewing on a lot lately, I think I've shared this before, is, is you know, what might it be like if we, um, if, if we acted and thought and you know, took our, if, 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 if we engaged in the world as though we actually belonged to the living world? You know, and Ken has talked about the nutmeg's curse and the, you know, the, the contrary position which we live in, which is that there's this you know, inert matter out there for us to exploit for our purposes. But what if we belong to the living world like we belong to a family or a marriage uh, or um, you know, a very different kind of relationship than a transactional business relationship? And I think that for me, that informs the AI conversation too. Uh, last thing I'll say is Shimon, I, lo I love the example you're giving because it's a great example about how chat GPT, et cetera, can be a valuable ally, partner, helper in complex processes. Um, but I'm I'm certainly not ready to hand over control to it. Although I hand over control every time I get an air, get on an airplane. Exactly. Yeah. But an airplane is far less complex than a constitution.
just realized I was muted. Um, the question of relative complexity is a thorny one for me. Um, and I think you know this, but it's Stuart and Doug, and please take your time stepping in. Yeah, so we're into some um, complexity here, <laughs> some some extraordinary complexity. Um, uh, you know, I was going to say sim something simple about three people ago, <laughs> and now it's become much more <laughs> complex. I mean, the idea of constitutions um, and the difficulty and the fear it, it's got to do with, you know, people wanting to retain their own power uh, versus surrendering to some constitution. Um, I think that may be part of the challenge right now in Israel in terms of, you know, you just be, be Netanyahu trying to keep himself out of jail. <laughs> and if the legislature gets power to overrule what the Supreme Court says, I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing how it comes down to individual self-interest sometimes in, the, in these areas. Um, Gil, I think you made a, you know, a great kind of overriding um, statement about you know AI in terms of its utility. That the notion is <clears throat> part of the living world. Um, I've been you know jumping into some um, Native American wisdom about a kinship society versus a commercial society, and that's where. You know, I, I think we've all gone off the rails. All of that said, um, I got through high school geometry by <laughs> starting with the proof and working my way backwards <laughs> and figuring out that I would, you know, either figure out or fudge a step in between and maybe the teacher wouldn't catch it or something, something, something like that. The thing about all religions that have a lot of followers, it creates a vision that pulls people forward. And so when I think about the, the entire AI conversation, and I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it, uh, I think about it as another tool that, that we as humans have invented. And I, I kind of a, a preliminary question is, you know, um, do we want to do we want to surrender our power to AI to a system <clears throat> uh, because we think they can do it better or not? So all of that is to say, I, I think a useful conversation, rather than looking at the problems, would be to look at the vision of how the technology can really be a tool and help us um, get forward to a, to a world um, that Gil described in terms of uh, 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 where we are part of a, a large living system and how does AI help us <clears throat> create, stabilize, um, organize, um, whatever is necessary to keep this, you know, um, species, not just alive, but to put it into a place where the, the species can thrive in a way that's congruent with the, the, um, um, the foundation of planet Earth that we, that we live on that um, can feed all of us, uh, but we are rapidly consuming. So how do we use it in a way that pulls us forward? And, and, and uses its best pieces to help do that. How does it fill in where our pieces of missing are gone awry?
there, there was a turn of phrase that that Gil used um, about um, the way we've been relating to the world in terms of exploiting and um, and extracting and uh, choosing to relate to it as if we're part of and connected to. And what struck me in the in the was the underlying sort of frame of that, as if we have a choice when in fact we are part of, we are connected to. Like that's reality. And everything we do has consequence in, in the, within the frame of natural law and look out our window and the evidence of our destruction and, uh, and, and waste and um, and brutality and ignorance is like everywhere. So um, I'm, you know, I think the emergence of AI has had the same effect as is happening in a lot of other facets of our culture and world, which is that it's pointed to um, through one lens, um, our generative creative power Please type the to, number in here. To, to create augmentative uh, tools, but through another lens um, to sort of blow apart the distinction between words generated by a human being versus words generated by an algorithm and the fact that, you know, it's not the words. That that can actually, at this point, be an equivalency and in some cases better. That maybe the intrinsic value, center of value is not about the expression or the artifact. It's about the underlying driver's purpose, intention, motivation, and values in the creation. So AI is, is a tool and it can enable us to create bigger, better, faster in, in certain respects in the hands of, but you put a gun in the hands of a bandit and it's gonna be used that way. So it's like, who's driving? And the responsibility dimension of that, the ownership dimension of um, what do, what am I doing? How am I contributing or not? And, and in what value frame and in service to what purpose, um, I think still ultimately determines the, you know, the outcome. I love, uh, Shimon, what you're sharing about Israel and, you know, is the challenge coming up with a constitution that is palatable or is the challenge recognizing that the fundamental center post of Israel's identity, which is a Jewish state, isn't Jewish. If you look at a map, it's a Swiss cheese picture of Arab settlements and Jewish settlements and, and this polyglot. Um, and um, if you're trying to root, root something that brings people together, which I think a constitution is an expression of, um, with its founding cornerstone being uh, a separation meme, which is this is a state just for us, just for one of uh, the different populations that reside there. It's how do you get past that? 
how do you create something inclusive? So I, you know, um, I really appreciate your commitment and your devotion and have the highest like wishes for your success um, and figuring out how to how to blend to enable um, people to connect and come together and align and share uh, in an expression of values. I think that's an extraordinary and awesome undertaking. And uh, I, I send um, energy for your success. I'll just respond very briefly because there's other people and I've already spoken. But in terms of the constitution, what I'm trying to do is I'm actually very much a Madisonian and Franklin in the sense that public opinion and educating citizens is a primary responsibility of government. And I think that the process is an educational process. Because when you ask most people about the US Declaration of Independence Constitution, well, they don't really know what you're talking about. We've all become con consumers at best of government. And I think we need to reclaim citizenship. So part of it is in the process. But I really like what Stuart said, and also you, Doug, in terms of how do we actually think about technology and make it for the better? So I'll give you an example. Before I started with the Constitution, which is just the last couple of months because of things that started happening in Israel, I started looking at medicine. You know, and AI plays a really, again, very interesting role in medicine. I mean, it's been tried. I mean, we can sort of like track it back to ELISA or even before there's expert systems and things of that kind. But the thing with AI that was really intriguing is how big of an uptake there is within medicine. And most recently, I found something very interesting is even University of California in San Francisco has this big grand round of how we can use a AI technology. And the thing that scares me and the thing that I want to devote more time in and get people around is the governance of the system. So when they talk about it is how can we, the University of California and San Francisco, leverage the data we have in our electronic medical records and other places in order to perhaps brand ourselves as an AI system that creates better care for people. In my mind, it actually should be for everybody. And the question is, how do you organize people so that don't contribute their data, or if they contribute to their data, it's made sure that it's available for everybody. Because what we're going to find very soon is that, let's say, my hospital system, or Penn, or even Epic, which is this huge, huge electronic medical record, which is used by probably like 70% of hospitals and healthcare system, initially funded by the government, has all this information on all of us. It's not someone wrote about, you know, credit union. I mean, this is information that everyone gives up. So AI, they're talking about leveraging that. And all of a sudden, like one healthcare system or one company owns all this information. So the question for me is like, what can we do in organizing people? How can we work within the democratic system to get legislation to deal with that? So I agree. I think it's a great tool I'm working on. By the way, if anyone is familiar with knowledge architecture and information theory, Shannon's information theory, because I think they're very central to everything we're talking about. Constitution, healthcare, everything like that. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to really understand better. So that's my two, my sixth sense at this point. Thanks, Shimon. I, I want to just clip in a little factoid before Stacy goes and then let Stacy pause, uh, which is that a friend of several of ours, I know Pete and a couple others know uh, him, is Tom Munnicky who helped develop the Vista software that runs the VA and was originally open source. And uh, one of his colleagues on the Vista program was Judy Faulkner, right. uh, who was back then a good colleague and then left to go make profit and founded Epic. 
Right. And so Epic and Cerner are sort of the two uh, duopolists that run hospital information systems. And I learned at, a, at the Linux member summit recently, I just bumped into a guy who knew this whole backstory. And I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, and it turns out that the Trump administration let out a no bid contract awarding Cerner uh, the VA system, the VA system, which is a, a, a travesty, a tragedy, and probably impossible. Like, like it's a, it's a multi, it's a major multi-million dollar project that may actually not work. Uh, and, and so we were Vista did work. Vista did work. Yeah, Vista is a is a pretty good system still. They just uh, they've just been withdrawing, but withdrawing funding from making it better. Well, I think that's just quick in addition to that. I think that AI, you know, like the open AI, they're using Wikipedia that started crowdsourcing. And then Microsoft and bought GitHub, which is also crowdsourced. So the question for us as citizens is how do we prevent information effort that we put into a process, including taxes, from then benefiting, you know, like three or four companies? Um, and there's a whole thread we can follow some other time about enclosure movements and uh, capture and all that kind of thing. But thank you for putting that on the table, Shimon. And I will go quiet and let Stacey bring us back. So my question is, how can we expect AI to help connect us to the living world when it's trained on information that's human centric. And I use animal, you know, biomedical research and animal husbandry as an example. Can you say a little more about that? And about the husbandry and so forth? What you mean? I think that the research out there on animal husbandry is not necessarily i would say it's i don't you know what i don't know because i've never looked up the research on animal husbandry however the way we look at animals seems to me to be very human centric as if they are here for us to use for our pleasure and so how can we connect in a way that we understand that we are all a part of each other when we think we are better than and that they are for us to use? Because, of course, God has given us dominion over all the creatures, right? Um, and that's the information the AI is going to be trained on, because that's what's that's what's in there. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. When it comes to AI and the, the and trust, um, my trust goes down in um, inverse relationship to the way in which the profit motive is at the heart of things. So. When I see AI as the next big thing, it makes me really distrustful of AI because there's people out there who are simply doing it to make money and rather than to really serve uh, humanity at the moment or the planet at the moment. And I, I wanna read a very brief story. How many people here know the Mullah Nasruddin, Sufi wise man and fool? Anybody familiar with this guy? He's a, a, a kind of a folk character in the Sufi world. Um, You've ever, if you've ever heard about the guy looking for his keys under the lamppost, that's that's actually a Mullah Nasruddin story, although it's found in other in other uh, traditions as well. So uh, this is the simple boatman. The Mullah was earning his living by running a ferry across the lake. He was talking to a pompous scholar on. He was taking a top pompous scholar to the other side. When asked if he had read Plato's Republic, the Mullah replied, "Sir, I am a simple boatman. What would I do with Plato?" The scholar replied, in that case, half your life has been wasted. Well, it kept quiet for a while and then, sir, sir, do you know how to swim? Of course not, replied the professor. I am a scholar. What would I do with swimming? Miller replied, in that case, all of your life has been wasted. We're sinking. And I think we're focused on 
reading Plato when we're in a boat that's sinking and we need to learn how to swim. Well, uh, the question is, how can we swim better? <laughs> um, you know, I put a question earlier about what is the difference between a constitution and governance, and I would say the the ethics of governance. Um, so that's just a question to, to to put out there. But I also did a chat GPT search on it to find out what came up there. <laughs> I'll share that too. Um, but I want to I want to dovetail back on something that Shimon was talking about because, all, and you touched on healthcare, and that's where I spend my time. And I've I've learned five different EMR systems, and the last one that I'm working on is Epic, and from my point of view, it's an epic failure. It disables my work. It <clears throat> disables my work. It's an impedance to care, and no, I I remember. Over 15 years ago, the CEO, and I can't remember his name, of all scripts coming to a medical staff meeting when I was uh, at the University of Rochester. And, you know, I, I didn't have the courage to ask the question, but I've thought about it many times. I'd like every CEO to come and spend a day with a primary care physician just watching what they have to do with the crap that they've built. It is unbelievably cumbersome. And it could be so enabling. So that's my, I, I'm just I'm just voicing my pet peeve. But I'd like to go back to the question, <laughs> which actually goes back to governance. Uh, what is the ethics of governance over technology? And what's the relationship between governance and the constitution? Uh, such a rich conversation. We weren't sure where we we're going when we started, but look at us now. Uh, Rick, I, I I can't read the rich thing you've just put in the chat, but I, I do want to uh, thank you for introducing the word into the conversation. Um, as I've been as I think about AIs, I'm what keeps striking me is that they don't care and they can't care, and human beings do. And that may be one of the more profound differences that we're going to be grappling with over the next few decades, because um, uh, care is real important. Um, and uh, I raised my hand to, <clears throat> to add a comment to what Stacy was saying. Um, you know, which is the question of what do the what do the large language models and the AIs, et cetera, point to? Where do they learn from? What you know, what data do they gather? And it's not just uh, um, you know, looking at animals as artifacts rather than as parts of the living world, but it's also which parts of the human world we pay attention to. And some of you may have seen the um, the uh, distorted map of the world published a week or so ago. Uh, you know, the size of the countries represents uh, uh, the intensity of something. And it was looking at where the data sets that these things are being trained on. And it's dominantly U.S., North America, somewhat Europe, hardly any Africa, very little Asia. Uh, and so we're building these worlds <clears throat> on a very, you know, very small subset of human culture and human experience. Uh, what could possibly go wrong with that? You're muted, you need Doug. to uh, unmute, Doug. 
There you go. You'd think I would learn. Um, <laughs> First time on Zoom happens all the time. <laughs> um, I can't tell if this conversation is tedious or creative. Uh, I think we're entering a time when somebody is going to say all men and computers are created equal. Uh, and I don't really want to go there. I think living in a world where all the world's art, millions of pieces are online and all the world's music is online and all the world's poetry is online, trivialize all those things. Uh, the pleasure of the search is gone. Uh, it's somehow, uh, we've been through the experience of seeing kids not learn multiplication tables because their handheld computer can do it. Aren't we going to enter the same thing with knowledge? Uh, why bother? Uh, better do some go out and play. End of rant. Well, I was going to go somewhere else, and I'll come back to this in a second. But what you just said, Doug, really, really um, intrigues and provokes me because I think that the accessibility of global art and music is fantastic, and that discoverability is taking new paths. Like you're running into somebody's Spotify playlist. I'm not not a Spotify fan, but but we can now play, we can now have docents from around the world telling stories around the world's artifacts in ways that were not possible before. Uh, most museums can only exhibit a 10th or less of their collection. They've got a whole bunch of stuff they never put out. Uh, in, in many cases, many cases that is now digitized and available. And, and I'm just thrilled that, that poems I have a large collection of poetry in my brain, and Ken has a larger one in his actual actual wet brain, um, because poetry is more accessible to me, and I don't have a lot of books of poetry on my bookcase. I have a few, but I don't actually open them very often. But my my poetry habit is much greater than it ever would have been because they're easily accessible online, et cetera, et cetera. And then the notion of trivializing, I love because a piece of my answer to some of the earlier questions is that we have to sort of re sacralize the world. Uh, and by which I don't mean bless it and make it Catholic or Jewish or Muslim, by which I mean treat it as sacred. And a question I asked many OGM calls ago is what if scientists treated what they do as sacred? And maybe the maybe the question to add here is what if programmers and managers treated their activities as sacred in some sense and the people whose who those activities touch as sacred? Might that change what they do, how they do it, how they consider it, what they do, and Ken's justifiable queasiness when he approaches profit motive as the driver of the thing. Uh, lowering trust uh, quickly uh, in different ways. So, so all of that um, burbles up immediately for me from what you said, Doug. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit to governance and constitutions and all that. And the notes I wrote to myself in the chat are, I'm kind of a governance minimalist and might have been a libertarian or something like that. I think that you know government should be as small as possible. Uh, not as uh, uh, what's it, what's his name said, so small you could drown it in a bathtub, uh, but rather uh, I prefer discourse. And I I have a, a saying that we pass laws and make rules when discourse fails. And I would rather that people and communities get together and, and figure out how to do things and then pass down what they've learned uh, as wisdom. And, and I'm very interested in the capture and communication of hard-won wisdom. That's one reason why I love pattern languages. Uh, and I, I see that some religions are really good at passing down that wisdom. Look at the yamas and niyamas from yoga, and some are not so good at it. And that's a whole other separate conversation. But I talk, um, when I get into this topic, I talk about small g governance versus large g government. 
And I'm really interested in the small G stuff. I'm really interested in how we come back together to figure out how to make better decisions, which is a big driver for my being in this call and with you all during, throughout the pandemic and so forth. Uh, last week, I was just looking over my brain notes for last week's OGM call, and uh, we brought in anarchism, which got demonized very successfully, but was an effort by many different communities to figure out how to thrive together with minimal governance. Like that, that's a that's a big piece of it, and, and trying to figure out what that you know what that means and how it works. Um, and so, constitutions feel to me like our attempt to write down the minimum set of operating things we must agree on, so we can turn to them. And uh, I think it was Shimon or one of us said, or maybe it might have been Gil who said that constitutions are intentionally hard to change, harder to change than basic laws, where you can just have a majority vote and oops, there's a law that's changed. And that's, that's on purpose to introduce some friction into the system so that the basic stuff can't be overrun by temporary uh, majorities that are a little bit whacked. Um, and so constitutions are interesting in that they're an attempt to write down like, hey, how do we, how do we, how do we live together um, for better or worse? And when you, when you tamper with the constitutions and mess things up, what you get is Peru right now, for example where the Congress is basically completely wildly out of control, full of people who've committed crimes and all, almost irredeemable. Like, like whoever shows up and is trying to run Peru is going to have a hell of time because they've screwed up how people get elected into their governing body. And it's, it's thoroughgoing. It's, it's really, um, it's a mess that's going to last uh, decades probably. So, so anyway, lots of different things bubbled up uh, from all the things that, that that we've been talking about, and I appreciate this conversation very much. Uh, boy, lot to, lot to digest. Um, Doug, I had a reaction to what you said, um, and, and that was um, um, the resistance to change or, or new things. But I was of two minds about, about that. At least that's what I heard. I heard, you know, let's keep, let's, let's you know, let's not, let's not fly airplanes. Let's not use computers. Uh, let's just kind of keep things the way they are. Um, and and this is this is the complexity piece. The flip side of that, though, you know, I had a negative reaction to what you said, like a pushback. The flip side was, um, uh, you know, all the conversations and return to indigenous wisdom. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of a little push pull. Um, the the governance and constitution question. Um, to me, a constitution is almost like a permanent board of directors, uh, large principles, um, whereas governance is uh, in, its, in its ideal or best format, how do, we, how do we take care as a collective things that an individual couldn't do, you know, like trash collection or, or, or any kind of policing function? Um, and obviously, one of the great challenges of that is, quote, the administrative state getting, you know, out of control. Um, um, Gil, you, you, you raised a really interesting point, and, and somebody put something in the chat about, you know, we've been using AI for a long time, like, uh, I think it was Pete talked about credit systems, um, and then combined, you know, with, with what Gil said about um, AI doesn't really have a heart um, it, 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 or something to that effect. Um, how can you factor that in? Um, and and I, I, I'm coming back to my, some of my legal, his, legal history now. Um, it used to be there were two separate court systems. One was a court of law, the other, well, other was a court of equity. Um, and in some ways, those systems were merged. And most 
people don't understand and most judges are actually afraid to use their overriding equitable powers, which are always there, um, which is a, you know, a, a great example of rules are made for the guidance of wise people and the adherence of fools, um, that you can get a terrible, terrible result. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to read a short poem. Um, and it's today's poem. And much, much to my always surprise and amazement, it actually speaks in some ways to the dialogue that we're that we're we're talking about today. Okay. Um, and it's called Eternal. Eternal. Mm -hmm. Does your heart rest in peace? cannot let go of fight with ease. Beauty emerges from that place as your essence embraces grace. No pretense or filtered you in a place of flow old and new. No joy when toiling life away without a place to slow and play. To capture who you are, let observers see the sparkling star. Eternal essence does not say or do its holy rhythm is the solace that's you. You're muted again, Doug. And I forgot to, I forgot to uh, not lower my hand. Doug, you want to go or I can go? Uh, go ahead. Thank you. So um, here are two absolutely amazing books. Um, Cybernetics, Transactions of the Ninth Conference, March 20 and 21, 1952. Um, I treasure the cybernetics macy conference series and the history of cybernetics here is bateson's last book gregory bateson's last book angel's fear towards an epistemology of the sacred um, it was finished by his daughter mary catherine bateson this is a book that i think every 18 year old should read they should read it again at 21 they should read it again at 25. They should read it again at 30 and every year afterward. Um, what did... Um, I think I wrote it down. AI doesn't have a heart. That was Stuart. Thank you for that, Stuart. There's a book I got from the library. I put an Amazon link, um, though... Uh, if I had more time, I would try to search for it on the Internet Archive and see if it's a book that you can check out yourself. Um, I'm going to read a tiny bit from the Amazon um, uh, page. Algorithms will soon know more about us than we know ourselves. Where should machine automation end? Um, and to summarize what I got from reading just a tiny bit of the first part of the book, is that we need to understand our own human ethics first. And we don't. And we need to do values clarification exercises individually. The motto, know thyself, applies since the ancient Greeks and, and certainly before that. Um, from the Chinese and and uh, sitting around the campfire um, discussing why one person got eaten by um, during the hunt and the other people came back with meat. To extend the value clarification exercise to 
what are our values together? What values do we share? As somebody said, what things don't change? And let's find out how we, you know, what we all share. I love the video where I forget which country it was, but um, they had a room of people and they asked a few questions and asked people to move and stand in groups um, from the mass into a group that could answer the question like, who here has mothers died? And all these people come and stand together and they look at each other. Okay, the next question. Who here's father has died? Who here has both parents living? A lot more people. And finding that we really do share really basic, common, sacred things. And angels fear um, where fools step in. I'm a fool. Thanks. It's hard for me to imagine a computer saying, quote, that's sickening, close quote. Um, I think where we are in culture, this is my latest thinking, is that from hunter-gatherers to now, we've woven a tapestry of increasing complexity. And we're going to keep doing that until all the connections are made and it's totally stifling and static. And that's in the nature of human cogn cognition to do that. And if that's true, the interesting place to live is not towards the end of the structure, but in the middle, like maybe in the art and science of the 19th century. Um, end of thought. Um, thinking about the, uh, well, I'll get back to how Doug's notion of uh, uh, thickening might relate. Um, but I think one of the threads here that keeps coming through to me, and I'm fascinated by hearing too little discussion of, and and curious to hear other people's thoughts about is that before we have, you know, a working system, a working constitutional system around AI, um, it, it seems to me that, um, well, let's, let's start with one thing. I mean, the AI as it exists now is in its mainframe era and the cloud era of data gathering is is a you know we're we're deluded into thinking there's something personal about our relationship to the data that we emit um you know we're we're still in this era of centrality um thinking about uh Thinking about Pete's example of credit scores, um, you know, credit scores used to be a black box that were that was you know totally mainframe, um, and oh, now we can you know check out our credit scores every day, but it's still in the possession of somebody else. Imagine that all the information, the the tools to compute one's credit score from one's own transactions lived with us not visible to others until we you know chose to make it visible for a purpose we needed it for 
and then think about that with regard to the data that we generate. And I, I'm to go back to what I was originally going to say, we're not going to have a working system around AI until we devolve every iota of data that's been gathered about each of us back to each of us. And if you can imagine a redefinition of selfhood in this era, just as you know, our thoughts make us who we are, our digital emissions now are recording our thoughts and impulses, and that's part of who we are. And that belongs to us, not other people to know about us without our knowing. And if you can imagine a, I'll also rope in what, um, I can't remember who was, who was saying it, but when you think about the, I think it might've been Gil about the, um, the distorted map of where the data that feeds AI um, comes from and how it's you know so predominantly US and, and Western and Northern. And if we had both in this country and in the world, a, an attitude toward digital reparations where we were trying to even those scales and give create create the data on the rest of the world by giving data provenance to the world's citizens i mean it's kind of i'm i've been discussing with a friend and and working on something uh called 40 terabytes in a mule um you know if we all had our own digital homes that that contained all that we has been gathered about us and that we admit and admit and could administrate that and then consensually share it back for different purposes our ai our individual ais would be incredibly useful to us and the the ability to see um, the AI wouldn't be able to say I'm sickened, but the ability to observe by being a, a representative, a, a, um, a consensual agent for us that we only share when we want to, I think, you know, our sickening um, and our, um, our enthusiasms could be represented in a way that they can't now by the, the data that's been gathered. You know, the data that's gathered on us um, shows what we are seduced by, not what we truly care about. And for us to create our own AIs of our true cares and our true, you know, the, the fact that that goes unnoticed that you know, our mother died within the last few years that, you know, we would be able to choose to consensually connect to other people for whom that is also true and discuss that around um, different groups. I'm sorry, this is, this is, it's a big dream, um, but I don't think it's a futile dream. And I'm really eager to hear other people's thoughts on it, other people's knowledge of any readings on it. Um, you know, devolving data back to us and letting us consensually share it, um, I think is a key to moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> The, the vision's a good vision. And it was the vision when the well was founded with Yao Yao, you own your own words, is you know, one of the governing principles. Um, 
yeah, let's own our own data. Let's be able to use our own data. It's hard to envision that in a in a in a world system built on enclosure and extraction. Uh, so we come back again and again to that question. Um, listening to what you were saying, I was struck by whoever it was posted earlier about McLuhan's observation that every augmentation is also an amputation. Um, you know, because I, I I think of us here. So we've been in conversation together. I don't know how many years. I think I've been in these for a couple of years. Um, and I'm, you know, and I know some of you better than others. And I'm getting to know all of you a little bit, but it's like we're these giant spheres touching. And the tangent point is infinitesimally small, right? And we spend time together and maybe these spheres start to interpenetrate a little bit. And there's a little, you know, there's a little, little overlap. Uh, and you know somebody very well, and there's a little bit more overlap, but it's always just a, a tiny sliver of who each of us is and what our experience is. Uh, and so, Michael, when you talk about all our data, all our data in quotes, um, that strikes me as a tiny sliver of a tiny sliver of a tiny sliver. It's just you know, such a partial representation of who any of us is and what our experiences are and what we care about. So the care comes back again and again in the conversation here. Um, you know, Doug, um, Carmichael, your comment about an AI not being able to say that sickens me. It doesn't have a belly. You know, it doesn't have a, 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 a an, an, um, an enteric nervous system. Uh, it doesn't have um, you know, chemistry coursing through it all the time, changing in ways we don't know. The, 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 the computer metaphor, I would argue, and this goes back to, you know, Hubert Dreyfus and others, is a very inadequate, um, powerful, but inadequate representation of what a human is. Uh, and we seem to be entering an era where we're going to double down on that model. And we've had other models. We had mechanical models of humans. We had hydraulic models of humans. We had what were the little, you know, homunculi models of humans. You know, uh, every few centuries, we have a different central model of what this is, demons on the shoulder and so forth. Um, the mechanical metaphor and now the computer metaphor is a metaphor. It's useful. We can do things with it. Uh, but God help us if we take it as truth. And God help us if we double down, if we put every, if we put all our chips on that game. I'm done. I'm waiting for Gil to lower his hand. Thanks again. Um, where I heard the notion um, of amputation is a paper. And I'm trying to find it and I can't. But it's uh, an American cultural critic. And the title of the paper is Final Amputation, where he points to McLuhan's in every argument, augmentation is also an amputation. I take the metaphor of cigarettes and further the metaphor of crutches to me what i read from i think this wonderful book cigarettes are sublime but it might have been another source is that cigarettes are an emotional crutch and basically um when you injure your leg you use a crutch. It's a third leg. You get used to it. But if you continue to use it after your leg heals, then your leg atrophies. And huh, emotions, regulation. Um, yeah, nicotine is a sacred drug. Um, there's some little Indian in a feather headdress smoking a peace pipe. Is that how we view tobacco today? Turquoise. Organic tobacco. Full-bodied taste. Bell. 
I remember a co-evolution quarterly, a link back to the well and uh, the whole earth group, edited by Kevin Kelly. Big title is All Panaceas Are Poison. And that leads to any number of notions, but it was a beautiful um, issue. Um, talking about uh, the problems with uh, computers and machines and how we when you lead back to the, fi uh, the final amputation paper. Uh, sorry, I can't uh, remember it. Nobody's found it yet, but um, couldn't find it on the net, which I thought was odd. Um, basically saying, yeah, we're, we're about to cut off our heads. We're about to give our agency to these decision-making things because it's cheaper we don't want to think my sister once said thinking about thinking that's nuts that's stupid who would ever do that I'm like oh, God. where thinking about thinking is great but if you actually do thinking about thinking about thinking and then thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking and then thinking about thinking factorial you really get to some interesting places. It's this, hmm. Asymptote. You start kind of, really kind of doing the redundancy and the stepwise refinement. And oh, what do the people call it? that uh, kind of amplification curve it's been noted by many ai people and people in um, innovation mm. and we got to be careful because asymptotes are difficult um and exponential curves are not regulated i work with terry deacon um uc berkeley i recommend him over and over and over again and I see, saw Jaron Lanier, who's a great friend of Terry Deacon, and he has um, written amazing things about how the translators who've done all this work of translation and been paid for it, typically, um, have had their intellectual property eaten by people who have a lot of computers. And that makes automatic translation possible the work done by humans copied by machines which put the translators out of work because they can no longer afford to be paying these translators to make translations because some people think they can make a heck of a lot of money by using their work previously to put them out of work and make money for themselves. It's a vicious cycle. It's positive feedback, which is kind of a weird way of saying a vicious cycle, something that feeds on itself over and over and over and over and over again and amplifies out of control. And control can be compared with manipulation. All current venture capitalists maybe not all but what i hear in the on the street in san francisco is basically if you want to start a company you basically have to suck data from your users keep that data for yourselves and then sell it to people up the chain who will give you money for that data so that they can manipulate i.e control without knowledge of the person being controlled at work, I'm controlled. I write an issue in JIRA and say, is this the priority? Yes or no. And okay, I agree to do this work. I'm going to receive a paycheck for that work. I'm controlled. I accept that control. But if a manager comes to me and goes, Mark, you're really smart. Oh, thank you so much for doing your work. Um, and tries to do something manipulative that's wrong and so terry deacon studies the emergence 
what he calls emergent dynamics, how thermodynamics is just there. It just happens. Entropy. It just works. But when you get to a higher level of emergence, you get amplifying systems, morphodynamics, basically whirlpools, um, what we know as self-organizing systems. When you get self-organizing systems that couple, you get this higher level dynamic, which is the beginning of a life called teleodynamics by Terry Deacon. And that basically is the start of self, is the start of something that has a goal to perdure, to exist longer than the gradient that feeds the whirlpool or self-organizing systems. And basically we can store energy inside a boundary, inside the membrane that we can use for later when the energy from the environment isn't coming in. But we have to, as beings, as living things, store that energy and regulate its release. Otherwise, we go out of control. We can't exist with a body temperature lower than, what, 80 degrees and higher than 120? So wisdom and you know the sacredness when it comes to knowing what to know and what not to know. There's a woman's tent mentioned in Angel's Fear where the men are not allowed to be around when a woman starts her menstruation or when women menstruate at all. I mean, there's this like, no, you do not, you're not allowed to know this. We have a regulation that says thou shalt not know and that's very very interesting when it comes to hackers anyway i've said it long enough stacy's smiling and uh i'll let her go next thank you so much for listening i'm smiling for the last part of what you said um the reason they're not, I know from going into sweat lodges, the reason they're not allowed, uh, well, women actually aren't allowed in the sweat lodge because that's when they're menstruating because that's when they're at their most powerful. And I think the reason for not having the men to be allowed there is to not break that flow of that sacred wisdom that's going on, um, which is kind of tied into why I raised my hand in the first place. I wanted to state the obvious not so much for the people here, but for the chatbots that might be listening, that as far as I know, wouldn't be able to make the inference that since we already said the large machine learning is done on, you know, mostly in North America, I just want to point out that most of the voices that are connected to the sacred knowledge, aside from the indigenous population, are carried by women through the stories that they told. A lot of it's embedded in fairy tales and seen as there's a lot in, in, in works of fiction. So I just want to point that out as well, that it's mostly, I mean, obviously that it's mostly male, but how important it is to maybe, maybe do some pruning and some injecting of knowledge so that the chat bots can pick up a more accurate picture. And I don't necessarily have a problem with starting in the US first, because it's it's kind of good sometimes to have a smaller sample that you can control. Because, you know, then there's less factors involved. You're not dealing with different cultural norms. So I just wanted to bring that up. just want to say very very quickly and i and i hear it in um in a number of the things that people say um the idea of ownership 
and and the exchange and commercial model is at the root of um, so many of the quote evils <laughs> that we're talking about. And um, and in order to invent something new, um, that whole mindset um, needs to be um, uh, purged. <laughs> Before, so, before something new can be uh, 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 as an operating system um, installed in some ways. Um, thank you all for a really fascinating conversation today. Sure, thank you for that. You reminded me of one of my favorite contrasts, which is ownership versus stewardship. And how Western society, maybe most notably the US, has become ownership <laughs> obsessed. And I didn't say stewardship. That's different. <laughs> no. <laughs> stewardship is being a good steward, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I'm I actually, curious why you're laughing. Yeah, I'm la I'm laughing because I, I I it happens to me periodically. People will you know in addressing and starting an email, will will say hello steward, and, <laughs> and it just it just makes me makes me laugh when I hear that. The other piece that I wanted to mention is you know, uh, <clears throat> perhaps it's easier for me to say this because in a in a in a 35 year old astrological reading by a brilliant savant um one of the first things th that was said was this guy is still on the loose they haven't they haven't locked him up yet he sees systems only for the purpose of completely reinventing them not tweaking them but just just totally getting rid of them and in in so many ways I, I think as a culture, we need those purges today. The question is, how do we do it without um, um, creating huge wars? I think we have the capacity, um, but that's just my science fiction mind. We shall see. Mm -hmm. From your lips to God's ears. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you, everyone. I've slipped a little bit over our time, but this has been, we, we, we found our way somewhere. Uh, and it's been a really lovely conversation. I am grateful. Thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, gratitude is, uh, yes, thank you.